bee is a type of insect. It's any insect in the superfamily Apoidea. There's about 20,000 species of bees worldwide at least. We have about 4,000 in North America and then we have about 365 in Massachusetts. The honeybee that we use here is the European honeybee and there's a bunch of different subspecies of the honeybee that we import from other areas of the world. Some that are from Italy, you have some that are from Russia, you have some that are maybe from Scandinavia. So honeybees and bumblebees and to some extent sweat bees live in these large social colonies where they help each other and they live together as one collective unit. And then there's varying degrees of social behavior, such as maybe you and me living together as next door neighbors. We're not necessarily helping each other, but we exist together. There are three types of bees in a hive. The queen, who is a fertile female, she lays all the eggs in the hive. She can lay anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 eggs a day. There are the worker bees, which are her daughters. They are infertile females. Younger worker bees tend to be more of these bees that will nurture and care for baby bees, their larvae. And then as the bees start to age, they engage in more foraging behaviors, because if you think foraging is a more risky behavior, so it tends to be the older workers that will engage in that type of behavior. Last of all, there are the drones, which are the male bees. They don't do much. They hang around, beg the females to be fed, and hope that a queen will be born so that they can chase her around. There is a drawback, however, to being a drone. Come the fall, and uh, there isn't sources of food around, the workers throw all the drones out of the hive. The way the bees recognize their hive is their biggest attribute is smell. Each queen produces a pheromone, and it's unique to that queen. So the bees actually, when they come back to the hive, there are guard bees that are supposed to recognize the bees from that hive and allow them in. But they really uh, orient themselves by the sun. So when they go out of a hive in the morning, they take a look at the sun and they know they can pinpoint it just like somebody using a GPS. They can pinpoint the front of their hive. You saw up here where some of my hives, I've got six of them right side by side, and the bees know exactly where they're going to. There's this little symbiotic relationship between plants and trees and flowers. And there's two things they get from flowers. One is pollen, and that provides the bees with proteins. And the other is nectar. And that's like perfume on a person. The bees smell it. Now it's pretty high in sugar content. They collect that, they bring it back to the hive. And this nectar will go into their crop and it will be mixed in with a bunch of different enzymes. And then the bee will regurgitate this up through their crop into other bees' mouths. And then it gets deposited in cells where it then gets fanned down and the water content gets evaporated off. They dry it out to get it to a certain water content so that it will keep because nectar spoils fairly fast or it ferments. And then what's the product that's left is honey. It takes a lot of work and a lot of bees to do this. One bee, I think, it, in their lifetime will do about one uh, portion of a teaspoon, not even a full teaspoon. So uh, the more bees you have in the hive, the more honey you get. What we use for a sweetener is sugar. And everything that I've ever read about, sugar is a processed product, but honey is a natural product, all natural. The first time I tasted my own honey, I thought, well, I'm just prejudiced. No, a local honey tastes much better than the stuff you buy in the store. Some people feel that consuming local honey can suppress your allergies. If you look at the, the number of people in the world that we have today and the mouths that we have to feed, there is no way that we could get this food to market without the pollination of the honeybee. My apples and blueberries get well pollinated. My neighbor who has a cranberry bog is very happy that I keep bees. About mid-June here in Carver, over 10,000 hives show up to pollinate the cranberries. Bees can pollinate flowers in a, in a number of different ways. It can be as simple as just crawling over the flower and spreading pollen between the anther and the sticky stigma. Bees have hair. 
the uh, pollen rubs off on those hairs. Honeybees actually have what are called pollen baskets on their legs. But bumblebees have uh, certain behaviors, and other bees have certain behaviors called buzz pollination, where they'll vibrate their bodies at a certain frequency, and that will actually shake pollen loose. And as it's jumping from flower to flower, the pollen that the flower gives off is being dispersed. And the bees don't do it on purpose. It's actually just a mistake to them. 36%-ish uh, food that we consume was somewhat dependent on pollinators. Now, if you really look at the actual study, what you'll find is that they used really exported data. So they looked at the food and agricultural organization, and they looked at what is the amount of net weight exported. So there are a number of different foods that were in that particular study that we don't necessarily need pollinators for, and if the pollinators did not exist, we would still have those foods. There was a food store down in Rhode Island one time that did a little experiment in their produce department. They took everything off the shelf that was pollinated by bees. Now all bees, honeybees, local bees, everything like that. And it turned out that 55% of the products that humans consume were gone from the store. Now, so you imagine yourself walking into a Stop and Shop or a Whole Foods and 55% of the produce was not there for you to buy. It'd be a pretty sad world, right? Honeybees are going to be your primary bee that's going to impact the economy. So you're really looking at almost two different aspects when it comes to looking at bees. You're looking at our, our honeybee, which is essentially our workforce. If we were to ever lose the honeybee, we can still import this. So this is something that's going to impact dollars, right? And then you have our native bees, which exist nowhere else in the world and are highly dependent on our ecology and almost want to separate those two and think about what are the things that I want to focus on. Do I want to focus on ecological impacts? And then, oh, of course, I want to focus on our native bees. Or economic impacts, and then, of course, I want to focus on my honeybees. So in China, pollution was so bad that they actually had to get the people up in the trees with little feathers and pollen. It has to be done at the exact right time to pollinate the the plants. Now, if you can imagine a, a pear tree or a cherry tree with 100 people in it, probably all the branches are going to break off, and it's very, very time-consuming. So you couldn't even come close to doing what 10,000 bees could do. I can recall a story from uh, my previous work experience where we were going around um, taking electric toothbrushes and pollinating tomato plants because it was to mimic the buzz pollination. And it actually worked, but if you could imagine just you yourself walking down aisles of plants, sticking a vibrating toothbrush into each flower. Very time consuming. You'd much rather release a bunch of bees and have them do the job for you. Colony collapse disorder is a term that cropped up in the, the 2000s, and it was a way to explain the mysterious disappearance of worker bees just leaving a hive and leaving, leaving the queen. But the term colony collapse has been used to explain just annual losses of honeybee hives despite other different factors. So if you were to lose a honeybee hive due to improper care or use of miticides or maybe a, a disease, that might still catch a headline as being called colony collapse, where in fact we know exactly what caused that. They came out with a new group of pesticides called neonicotinoids, made from nicotine. The bees were actually taking that pesticide, bringing it back to the hive, and what that pesticide did, it made them lose their mind. So the next time they flew out of the hive, they didn't know how to find their way back home. So if they can't go back, the colony keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller until there's nothing left in there but the queen and a couple bees. A honeybee colony can't survive that way. The manufacturers of the pesticides have made it so that the insects don't realize they've consumed it till after they've consumed it because they want to kill the insect. And what is a bee but an insect? There are a lot of different diseases that mosquitoes transmit they are controlled by the use of pesticides. So pesticides yearly are saving a lot of lives, a lot of human lives. But the issue comes to overuse of these pesticides or use in areas where they can cause a lot of ecological harm. I look at them in the same way that people might look at medicine. If you're taking medicine every single day and you're not sick, that can cause your body a lot of harm. 
but if you take it when you're sick, it can save your life. And I look at pesticides exactly that way. One of the things that gets brought up often is maybe neonicotinoids are causing colony collapse or these, these large hive losses. Now neonicotinoids will cause honeybee death, but it doesn't explain how Australia has use of neonicotinoids, but they don't experience this colony collapse but they also don't have varroa mites. So it almost seems like, is varroa the main cause? We don't know. There's two types of mites that affect bees, varroa mites and tracheal mites. And the varroa mites are a relatively new pest, only showed up in this country roughly 20 years ago. They're native to Asia, and they're essentially found worldwide, with the exception of certain locations like Newfoundland and Australia. Uh, this mite, we used to think was like a vampire, where it would drain the blood of a bee. But in fact, it actually feeds on the bee's fat body, which is a lot like your liver. And without your liver, your liver it processes a lot of toxins. And uh, in the bees, it's actually used as a food source to sustain them through the winter. So this is a really, really important organ. And without that, we think that it might cause the bees to become very fragile. And so uh, I think that the varroa is having this long-term impact. And even though we didn't lose the same number of hives when varroa was first introduced, that over the years we've just added on more and more to the point where the damage that varroa has done, the bees have no way to protect themselves. You can actually see the mites on the bees. They're very hard to see. They're about the size of a, a dot in a, a piece of paper. It reduces the vitality of the hive so that they may succumb to other stresses. I think the real answer is very complex. I think the mites are part of it. I think pesticides are part of it. And I think environmental breakdown is part of it. There are a number of different viruses that are actually passed from hive to hive. And we actually see that these bees are actually passing them onto other species of bees and even to flies. So when you have a honeybee hive that has some of these viruses and they're foraging on flowers in the area, we find that bumblebees and surfeit flies in that area are actually coming back with those diseases as well. So these honeybees that are being shipped around the country we think might be spreading a lot of diseases around the country into areas where they may not have had the diseases. One of the problems I have in trying to keep my bees healthy is the introduction of all of the migratory beekeepers in June. 10,000 hives show up that can be carrying God knows what diseases or pests, and I'm gonna have trouble keeping my bees healthy. As we see, uh, certain bees tend to disappear. Other bees tend to become more plentiful. So our common eastern bumblebee, um, the ratio of bees tends to shift in terms of species. So in certain areas, you have almost nothing but common eastern bumblebee bombs and patients. In other areas, you have uh, a more even spread, more diversity. We've messed up our environment so much with pesticides and other pollutants that the honeybees can't take it. And potentially we could be next. Personally do away with all pesticides if we could, but if you, you have to use them, you wanna use them per the directions. Our club has been working with the state legislature to try and get the pesticide companies just to put a label on the product that says, it contains a pesticide. Let the buyer make the choice. I think one of the most important things is to recognize that uh, your honeybee f can fly up to two miles, but some of our native bees, you're looking at one-tenth to a third of a mile. So it's really important to know that we can't fight this alone. Just kind of like honeybees where you have 10,000 bees working together as a group, to produce a hive, I think people need to really band together to help save the bee. Because it's one yard isn't gonna do it. But if we all take part in trying to save these bees, I think it, the cumulative effect will make a really large impact. If we can make people understand what's gonna happen here without the bees, I think people are gonna react in a very positive way all by themselves. The most important thing we can do is just spread the word about it teach people about it, let people know that this is not a trend, that this is not going away, that it's really important to wake people up to the fact that we need to keep trying, we need to keep at this. So my most fulfilling part is this. I love educating other people. It's all about the education of honeybees because there's so many misconceptions out there. Get to know the bees, get to know honeybees, and then get out there and plant some flowers.
Monoculture agriculture is one of the worst things for bees because there's only one source of food. You can imagine if you only ate one food, that's it. So it's nice that the bees have a variety of trees and flowers and, and uh, pollen and nectar sources, to, and I think it's healthier for them. The bees would benefit so much from this, all bees. The biggest thing that will help the honeybee right now is for people just to educate themselves a little about what the bees are doing and what the bees need. And they, they need a lot of help right now, they really do. And that looks good. Nice solid pattern. Great content. We got a little bit of honey in the corners, and that's typical. You can see some uncapped brood down in the corner over here. Oh. Oh, wow. You see that big fat drone in the middle? The queen will have a longer abdomen if we see her. Is she like significantly bigger? Uh, the, the workers, yeah. 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 But she's not fat like the drone is. Okay. And all, how many bees do you own? We have 10 hives per So, doesn't like one hive hold like 10,000? Oh, yeah. So, you only own 80,000. This is my best hive. So, you own 10,000 bees? Oh, God, no. Yeah, I got 10. It's, it's, say there's 40,000 in each hive as an average. I got 10 hives, that's 400,000 bees. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, I, my math was incorrect. <laughs>